In 2021, Boulder City, Nevada, was a destination for thrill-seekers with its proximity to popular skydiving locations and adventure hubs. It was here that Natalie and Ryan Bennett built their seemingly perfect life. Natalie, a talented interior designer known for her quiet demeanor and attention to detail, had always admired her husband's confidence and charm. Ryan, a skydiving instructor with years of experience, was well known in the local community. His daring personality and ability to put first-time jumpers at ease earned him a reputation as one of the best instructors in the area. Their marriage, from the outside, appeared solid. Ryan's charisma and Natalie's supportive nature seemed to complement one another. While Natalie often kept to herself focusing on her design projects, Ryan thrived in the social environment of his work, surrounded by a steady flow of students and fellow skydivers. Their friends and acquaintances viewed them as a successful couple balancing stability with the excitement of Ryan's adventurous career. However, behind the facade, their relationship was becoming increasingly strained. Ryan's job required long hours, frequent weekend work, and travel to nearby skydiving events. This often left Natalie alone, a dynamic she had initially accepted as part of being married to someone in a demanding and unconventional profession. Over time, though, the distance between them began to feel more emotional than physical. Natalie, who had never shared Ryan's passion for skydiving, felt disconnected from his world. Her reservations about the sport and his lifestyle were dismissed as unnecessary worry. The turning point came one evening when Natalie found herself alone at home. Ryan had left his phone unattended, and a notification caught her eye. It was a message from Emily, a student who had recently completed several tandem jumps with Ryan. Curiosity and suspicion overcame her, and she unlocked the device. What she discovered confirmed her worst fears. The explicit text messages between Ryan and Emily left no doubt about the nature of their relationship. When confronted, Ryan admitted to the affair but minimized its significance, describing it as a one-time mistake born out of stress and poor judgment. He apologized profusely, insisting that it would never happen again. While outwardly Natalie seemed to accept his explanation, her internal reaction was far different. The trust that had once been the foundation of their marriage was irrevocably shattered. The betrayal left her feeling humiliated and disillusioned emotions she kept hidden behind a calm exterior. Natalie began to withdraw from Ryan emotionally. She immersed herself in her work, avoiding unnecessary conversations and distancing herself from social interactions with his colleagues. While Ryan interpreted this as a phase of quiet reconciliation, Natalie was silently harboring a growing sense of resentment. Her mind frequently returned to the messages she had seen and the embarrassment of knowing that others might have suspected what she had only recently discovered. Rather than confront Ryan further or pursue a divorce, Natalie began considering how to regain a sense of control over the situation. The imbalance in their relationship, exacerbated by the affair, fueled her thoughts. She replayed moments from their marriage, noticing the ways Ryan's charm had often overshadowed her own desires and priorities. Quietly, she resolved that the pain and humiliation she felt would not go unanswered. Her demeanor remained composed, giving no outward indication of the turmoil within. She continued to support Ryan's career, attending occasional events and maintaining the image of a loving wife. Meanwhile, she began researching aspects of his work, ostensibly to better understand his world, but with a far darker intention forming in the back of her mind. The cracks in their marriage remained invisible to most of those around them. Ryan, relieved that Natalie hadn't pressed the issue further, believed their relationship was on the mend. For Natalie, however, the betrayal was a wound that festered beneath the surface, driving her toward a decision that would irreversibly alter both their lives. Natalie's suggestion of a joint skydiving experience seemed like an unexpected breakthrough in her strained relationship with Ryan. She approached the idea carefully, presenting it as a personal challenge she wanted to overcome. She framed it as a way to connect with Ryan on a deeper level by finally stepping into his world, something she had always avoided. Ryan, eager to see Natalie embrace his passion, welcomed the idea with enthusiasm. He saw it as a hopeful sign that their marriage was on the mend, a chance to rekindle their bond. Privately, Natalie's motivations were far from what she portrayed, her decision to skydive had little to do with reconciliation. Instead, it served as the perfect cover for a carefully calculated plan. Over the weeks leading up to the jump, Natalie began preparing in secret, 
using her meticulous attention to detail to research skydiving equipment and procedures. She combed through online forums, instructional videos, and manuals to understand the intricacies of parachute mechanics. She paid particular attention to common points of failure and the circumstances under which malfunctions could occur. Initially, Natalie's research appeared innocent, even to herself. She reasoned that her unfamiliarity with the equipment justified her deep dive into the technicalities. However, as her resentment toward Ryan simmered, her intent shifted. The knowledge she was gathering became less about alleviating her own fears and more about exploring vulnerabilities in the system. Her focus turned to how minor alterations in parachute rigging could lead to catastrophic outcomes while appearing accidental. Natalie's plan took shape slowly. She learned that a parachute system included both a main chute and a reserve, with redundancy designed to ensure safety. To avoid suspicion, any tampering would need to be subtle enough to bypass routine checks, yet significant enough to cause failure mid-air. After extensive study, she identified a critical weak point, the reserve chute's deployment mechanism. A slight misalignment of the pin or damage to the closing loop could prevent the reserve from deploying properly, even in an emergency. As the date of the jump approached, Natalie began testing her newfound knowledge. She purchased rigging tools online under the guise of wanting to understand Ryan's world better. On a few occasions, she practiced with spare fabric and cords, ensuring her modifications were precise and undetectable. She took care to maintain her usual demeanor around Ryan, avoiding any behavior that might raise suspicion. On the morning of the jump, Natalie executed her plan with calm precision. While Ryan was preoccupied with packing gear for the day, she accessed his parachute rig. With steady hands, she altered the reserve deployment system, subtly loosening the pin just enough to ensure failure under stress. She inspected her work, confident it would go unnoticed during routine checks. Satisfied, she carefully returned the rig to its original state, leaving no outward signs of tampering. As they drove to the airfield, Natalie maintained her role, projecting a mix of nervousness and excitement. She asked questions about the experience, feigning interest in how the jump would feel and what she should expect. Ryan, thrilled to see her so engaged, was eager to reassure her. He promised to guide her through every step, unknowingly falling into the trap Natalie had set. At the airfield, Natalie continued her act. She allowed Ryan to inspect her equipment, playing the part of a cautious first-timer. Ryan, meticulous as ever, double-checked her gear and gave her an encouraging smile. He then turned his attention to his own parachute, performing the same checks he had done countless times before. His experience and confidence in his routine blinded him to the subtle sabotage that had been carried out. By the time they boarded the plane, Natalie's demeanor had solidified the illusion. She appeared outwardly anxious but determined, leaning on Ryan for reassurance. For Ryan, this was a pivotal moment in their relationship, a step toward repairing the damage caused by his infidelity. For Natalie, it was the culmination of weeks of planning, a carefully crafted setup for what she intended to look like an unfortunate accident. The stage was set and there was no turning back. The morning of the jump dawned clear and bright, perfect conditions for skydiving. The couple arrived at the small airfield outside Boulder City, Nevada, where Ryan worked as an instructor. The energy was light-hearted, with staff and students exchanging jokes and banter. Natalie maintained her carefully crafted demeanor, appearing slightly nervous but determined. To everyone around her, it seemed like she was finally stepping into Ryan's world, embracing the thrill he loved so much. Ryan was visibly elated, mistaking Natalie's participation for an olive branch in their strained relationship. The team for the jump included Ryan, Natalie, an instructor for her tandem experience, and a cameraman who had been hired to capture Natalie's milestone. The plan was simple. Ryan would jump first, showcasing his experience, followed by Natalie and her tandem instructor. The cameraman would exit last to document the entire sequence. The group boarded a small Cessna plane, its interior cramped but familiar to Ryan, who had made this ascent hundreds of times. Natalie took her seat next to him, her hands gripping the harness straps as she feigned a mix of excitement and nerves. Ryan reassured her, promising the experience would be unforgettable. His enthusiasm and apparent pride in her willingness to participate blinded him to any suspicion. As the plane climbed to 10,000 feet, the air inside the cabin grew tense but excited. Ryan reviewed his equipment one final time, a routine he had perfected over the years. 
His confidence in the gear masked the subtle sabotage Natalie had performed earlier. She watched him out of the corner of her eye, ensuring he gave no indication of noticing anything amiss. When the plane reached altitude, the door was opened, and the sound of rushing wind filled the cabin. Ryan, ever the showman, volunteered to jump first. He gave Natalie a reassuring smile before stepping out of the plane. He performed a perfect exit, disappearing into freefall with the precision of someone deeply experienced. Natalie's tandem instructor guided her to the edge of the door, securing their connection and preparing for their jump. She hesitated for a moment, playing into her role as a nervous first-timer, before they launched into the sky. Seconds after Natalie and her instructor exited the plane, the cameraman followed. His task was to capture Natalie's reactions and document the moment she overcame her fears. As they fell through the sky, Natalie's forced exhilaration masked the storm brewing within her. From her perspective, Ryan was already below, a speck in the distance performing his descent. Ryan's freefall was textbook until it came time to deploy his parachute. He pulled the ripcord for his main chute, but instead of the canopy unfurling smoothly, it tangled into a streamer flapping uselessly in the wind. This malfunction immediately put Ryan into an uncontrolled spin. The centrifugal force made it difficult for him to regain stability or assess the extent of the problem. From above, Natalie caught sight of Ryan's flailing form, recognizing the signs of trouble. She maintained her composure, ensuring her tandem instructor and the cameraman wouldn't suspect her involvement. Ryan, meanwhile, attempted to cut away the main chute and deploy his reserve. However, when he pulled the handle for the reserve chute, it failed to deploy fully. The lines appeared to catch for a brief moment before the reserve tangled, rendering it just as useless as the main canopy. Ryan's descent accelerated, his body spinning wildly as he fought for control. From Natalie's vantage point, his figure shrank rapidly, disappearing into the distance below. Her tandem instructor, unaware of what was unfolding, focused on their descent, guiding Natalie toward the designated landing zone. On the ground, chaos erupted as observers realized something had gone horribly wrong. Ryan's trajectory deviated sharply from the expected path, and he crashed into a rocky area far from the intended landing site. Witnesses called for emergency responders, but by the time paramedics arrived, Ryan had succumbed to his injuries. Natalie's tandem instructor landed them safely moments later. The excitement of her first jump was overshadowed by the commotion surrounding Ryan's crash. She played her role convincingly, acting horrified and distraught as she rushed to the scene. Her cries and trembling appearance convinced those around her that she was a devastated wife, reeling from the tragedy she had just witnessed. The initial assessment of Ryan's equipment pointed to an improbable dual parachute failure. Skydiving experts at the scene began reviewing the gear but found no immediate explanation for the malfunction. The rare nature of such an incident, combined with Ryan's experience, left many puzzled. Unbeknownst to them, the answers they sought were hidden in the deliberate tampering Natalie had executed before the jump. When Natalie and her tandem instructor touched down on the designated landing zone, the scene below was already spiraling into chaos. Spectators, fellow skydivers, and staff members were gathering at the edges of the drop zone, their attention fixed on the distant rocky terrain where Ryan had fallen. A sense of urgency filled the air as someone yelled for an ambulance. The first responders on site rushed to their vehicles, navigating the uneven desert terrain to reach Ryan's location. Ryan had plummeted into an area outside the usual landing zone, a rocky patch scattered with boulders and low brush. The impact had been catastrophic. When medics reached him, his body showed signs of severe trauma consistent with a high-velocity fall. His helmet, though intact, had done little to protect him from the force of the collision. Paramedics checked for vital signs, but it was immediately clear that Ryan had not survived. The scene was grim, with Ryan's equipment twisted and partially buried in the dust. The wreckage of his parachutes, both the tangled mane and the reserve, lay nearby, offering no immediate clues to what had gone wrong. Natalie, meanwhile, was still in the main drop zone. As word spread of Ryan's accident, she began to draw attention. Her tandem instructor, unaware of her role in the events that had unfolded, kept reassuring her as she removed her gear. She appeared visibly shaken, her hands trembling as she unbuckled her harness. Observers nearby noted her pale complexion and wide eyes, interpreting her reaction as shock from witnessing such a traumatic event. When a staff member approached to tell her about Ryan's death, 
Natalie collapsed to the ground, clutching her helmet and sobbing uncontrollably. Her cries carried across the drop zone and her trembling hands seemed incapable of holding anything steady. She gasped for air between sobs, recounting how she had seen Ryan's parachute fail and watched him spin helplessly toward the ground. Her vivid descriptions of his struggle added to the tragic weight of the moment. Ryan's colleagues, many of whom had known him for years, gathered around to offer their condolences and support. None suspected foul play. They were too consumed by grief over the loss of a friend and colleague who had been such a central figure in their community. Ryan's reputation as a meticulous and experienced skydiver lent credibility to the assumption that this was a tragic accident rather than negligence or malice. As the authorities arrived to document the scene, they began a routine investigation. Two detectives spoke with witnesses, including Natalie, the tandem instructor, and the cameraman who had captured the jump. Natalie's emotional state left no room for doubt in their minds about her innocence. Her tears, shaky voice, and vivid recounting of Ryan's final moments painted her as a devastated widow overwhelmed by the horrific loss of her husband. Preliminary inspections of Ryan's gear suggested a rare but possible dual parachute failure. The main chute had not deployed fully, tangling into a streamer, while the reserve chute showed evidence of incomplete deployment. Investigators collected the parachute rig, harness, and remaining gear for further analysis. They took detailed photographs of the scene, noting the trajectory of Ryan's fall and the placement of the equipment. However, nothing about the initial findings raised suspicions. Catastrophic equipment failure, while uncommon, was not unheard of in the world of skydiving. As the ambulance departed with Ryan's body, Natalie remained at the drop zone, surrounded by Ryan's colleagues and staff who offered their condolences. She played the role of a grieving widow with precision, leaning on others for support, and repeating how she couldn't believe what had happened. She allowed herself to be escorted to a quieter area, where she sat clutching a cup of water she never drank, her tear-streaked face an image of despair. By the time the authorities wrapped up their initial investigation, the narrative of the day was set, a tragic accident caused by a rare and unpredictable malfunction. Ryan's colleagues and the investigators accepted this conclusion without question, focusing their attention on supporting Natalie through her apparent grief. The gear was sent to a forensics lab for analysis, but no one anticipated finding anything unusual. For now, Natalie's act had worked flawlessly. The attention was on Ryan's equipment, not on her, and the tragedy was attributed to fate rather than foul play. As the sun set over the desert, the drop zone grew quieter. The day's horrific events lingered in the minds of everyone present. For Natalie, the chaos had unfolded exactly as she had planned. Her calculated emotional display had shielded her from suspicion, and the narrative she had orchestrated was now firmly in place. Ryan's death was officially recorded as an accident, and Natalie returned home, the center of sympathy and support, knowing she had just passed the first critical test of her plan. In the months following Ryan's death, Natalie quickly stepped into the role of a grieving widow. Her tearful public appearances, combined with her composed handling of legal and financial matters, painted her as a woman trying to move forward after a devastating loss. Ryan's life insurance policy, a substantial $1 million payout, was processed without issue. The high coverage amount, justified by his dangerous profession, raised no immediate suspicions. To those around her, Natalie appeared reluctant to accept the money but in private, it became the foundation for her next chapter. Natalie sold their home in Boulder City, citing painful memories as her reason for leaving. She quietly distanced herself from the skydiving community, avoiding Ryan's colleagues and mutual acquaintances. Her departure was seen as an understandable need to escape the constant reminders of her loss. By the time she moved to Phoenix, Arizona, Natalie had severed nearly all ties to her previous life. In her new city, she embraced anonymity, settling into a quiet suburban neighborhood, and beginning to rebuild her life. Initially, Natalie kept a low profile. She refrained from extravagant spending, knowing that drawing attention to her newfound wealth could invite questions. Her neighbors in Phoenix knew little about her past, seeing only a reserved woman who mentioned losing her husband in a tragic accident. Natalie carefully curated her interactions, ensuring that her story of grief and resilience garnered sympathy without revealing too many details. As months passed, Natalie gradually allowed herself to step back into the world of social connections. 
During a professional networking event, she met David Warner, a software engineer known for his easygoing nature and genuine kindness. David, drawn to Natalie's quiet strength, admired the way she spoke about overcoming adversity. Natalie, recognizing an opportunity to cement her new life, reciprocated his interest. Their relationship developed quickly. David was attentive and understanding, often expressing admiration for Natalie's ability to rebuild after such a traumatic loss. He provided a stark contrast to Ryan, whose charisma often masked a lack of emotional depth. David's stable career and dependable personality offered Natalie a sense of security, and she leaned into the idea of starting fresh. Within months, Natalie and David became inseparable. Friends and colleagues described their relationship as one of mutual respect and shared goals. Natalie spoke sparingly about her life in Boulder City, framing her past as something she was ready to leave behind. Her stories about Ryan were brief and carefully constructed, focusing on the love they had shared while avoiding any mention of their marital struggles or her role in his death. A year after their first meeting, Natalie and David married in an intimate ceremony. Unlike her previous wedding, which had been a grand affair with friends and family, this event was small and understated. Natalie presented it as a conscious decision to honor her late husband while moving forward. The few who knew her well remarked on how happy she seemed, noting the contrast between her past grief and her current contentment. Despite appearances, Natalie's carefully constructed new life began to show cracks. Small details from her past occasionally surfaced, triggered by interactions with people who reminded her of Ryan or by news about skydiving accidents that brought back memories. She grew increasingly cautious, fearing that any misstep could lead to questions she couldn't answer. Her polished facade required constant maintenance, and the pressure began to weigh on her. Unbeknownst to Natalie, Ryan's close friend Alex Morales, a seasoned skydiving instructor, had been quietly revisiting the circumstances of Ryan's death. The unusual nature of the equipment failure and Ryan's meticulous attention to safety continued to nag at Alex. His private investigation, though informal, was beginning to uncover inconsistencies in the initial conclusions about the accident. As Natalie settled into her new marriage, Alex's efforts gained traction. He reached out to experts in skydiving equipment, reviewed reports from the initial investigation, and found anomalies in the condition of Ryan's gear. Slowly, he began piecing together a timeline that pointed to the possibility of foul play. While Natalie enjoyed the comfort and stability of her new life with David, Alex's suspicions were forming the foundation of a case that would eventually reach authorities. In Phoenix, Natalie remained unaware of the storm brewing behind her. She focused on cultivating her image as a resilient survivor and a devoted wife to David. Her new life seemed secure, but the foundation of lies upon which it was built was beginning to crumble. The carefully hidden secrets of Ryan's death were on the verge of resurfacing, threatening to unravel everything Natalie had worked so hard to rebuild. Months after Ryan's death, Alex Morales, a seasoned skydiving instructor and one of Ryan's closest friends, found himself unable to let go of the unanswered questions surrounding the accident. The official conclusion of catastrophic equipment failure didn't sit well with him. Ryan was not only a meticulous skydiver, but someone who had always prioritized safety. He had taught others to inspect their gear thoroughly, a habit Alex had witnessed countless times. The odds of both the main and reserve parachutes failing simultaneously seemed almost impossible, especially given Ryan's experience. Alex began his investigation informally, driven by a mix of grief and suspicion. He revisited the initial accident reports and spoke with the staff who had been on duty that day. Maintenance logs for the parachute rig in question were the first documents he requested. The rig had been inspected and packed by professionals with impeccable records, leaving little room for human error during preparation. The riggers who had worked on Ryan's gear stood by their work, confident that no issues had existed before the jump. Alex's conversations with other instructors only deepened his doubts. The main chute's failure as a tangled streamer was rare but not unheard of. However, the reserve chute's malfunction was far less common, especially considering Ryan's skill level. He had been trained to handle emergencies and was adept at deploying the reserve under pressure. For both systems to fail so catastrophically suggested either a freak accident or deliberate tampering. Determined to find answers, Alex expanded his inquiry to include the events leading up to the jump. He interviewed staff members and reviewed surveillance footage from the airfield. 
It was during these reviews that he noticed something peculiar. Natalie had shown a sudden and unexplained interest in parachute rigging weeks before Ryan's death. She had been seen asking questions about packing procedures and had even purchased basic rigging tools. While this could have been dismissed as curiosity from someone married to an instructor, Natalie had no prior history of involvement in skydiving operations. Suspicious, Alex began tracing Natalie's actions in the weeks before the accident. A search of local purchase records revealed that Natalie had bought additional tools online, items commonly used for altering parachute lines and pins. At the time, this purchase had raised no alarms, as she framed it as an attempt to better understand Ryan's work. However, in hindsight, the timing seemed deliberate. Alex turned his attention to Ryan's gear, which had been stored as evidence after the accident. He requested access through his connections in the skydiving community, setting his expertise as a way to provide insight. Upon examination, he discovered subtle signs of tampering on the reserve chute. The closing loop of the reserve had been slightly frayed, weakening its integrity. Additionally, the deployment pin appeared to have been loosened just enough to cause delayed or incomplete deployment. These findings were significant, but circumstantial. Alex knew he needed more concrete evidence before approaching the authorities. He began digging into Natalie's digital footprint, a task that revealed troubling patterns. Search histories linked to her account included inquiries about parachute malfunctions, common failure points, and even scenarios where skydiving accidents were deemed unintentional. The searches dated back weeks before the fatal jump, aligning with her sudden interest in rigging. Financial records further corroborated Alex's suspicions. Natalie had received a substantial life insurance payout after Ryan's death, but the funds had been quickly transferred into new accounts. While not inherently suspicious, the rapid movement of money combined with her new life in Phoenix painted a picture of someone eager to sever ties with her past. Armed with this evidence, Alex presented his findings to the local authorities. Initially skeptical, investigators agreed to reopen the case, intrigued by the compelling nature of the anomalies Alex had uncovered. Forensic specialists were brought in to re-examine Ryan's gear, focusing on the tampering Alex had identified. Their analysis confirmed that the damage to the reserve chute and the weakened lines were deliberate, not the result of wear and tear or manufacturing defects. As the investigation deepened, the evidence against Natalie continued to mount. Records of her purchases, internet searches, and financial transactions painted a damning picture. Investigators noted that her behavior in the months following Ryan's death moving away, avoiding the skydiving community, and rapidly remarrying suggested an effort to distance herself from suspicion. By the time the authorities concluded their analysis, they had enough evidence to pursue charges. Natalie's role in Ryan's death was no longer a question of speculation, but a matter of criminal intent. The revelation sent shockwaves through the skydiving community and marked the beginning of a legal case that would unravel the carefully constructed facade of Natalie's new life. In the quiet suburb of Phoenix, Natalie's life unraveled early one morning when detectives arrived at her doorstep with a warrant for her arrest. Clad in professional attire, they entered her home, calmly explaining the charges against her first-degree murder. Natalie, stunned but composed, maintained her innocence as she was escorted out in handcuffs. Neighbors peered through windows, their curiosity piqued by the sudden commotion. Within hours, the news of her arrest spread, linking her to the suspicious death of her first husband, Ryan Bennett in what had initially been ruled a tragic skydiving accident. At the station, detectives began their interrogation. Natalie's demeanor shifted between defiance and vulnerability as they laid out the evidence against her. The forensic analysis of Ryan's parachute, her internet search history, and her financial records painted a damning picture. When confronted with the details, Natalie initially denied all accusations, insisting that Ryan's death had been an accident. However, as the questioning intensified and the weight of the evidence became undeniable, she broke down. Natalie admitted to tampering with Ryan's parachute but denied intending to kill him. Her actions, she claimed, were born out of desperation and heartbreak. She described feeling humiliated and invisible after discovering Ryan's affair, portraying her actions as a misguided attempt to force him to acknowledge her pain. She insisted she had only meant to create a malfunction that would compel him to rely on his reserve chute, believing he would survive the ordeal. 
This explanation, however, did little to mitigate the gravity of her actions in the eyes of the investigators. The case quickly became a media sensation, with headlines dubbing Natalie the Widow Jumper. Reporters and commentators dissected every aspect of her life, from her marriage to her carefully planned move to Phoenix, her swift remarriage to David Warner, and the substantial life insurance payout further fueled public speculation about her motives. Natalie, once a figure of quiet resilience, was now cast as a cold and calculating criminal in the court of public opinion. The trial began months later in a packed courtroom, with Ryan's family seated prominently in the gallery. Prosecutors presented a meticulously constructed case, arguing that Natalie's actions were premeditated and motivated by financial gain. They detailed her purchase of rigging tools, the tampering with Ryan's reserve chute, and her internet searches about parachute malfunctions. They emphasized the improbability of her claim that she only intended to scare Ryan, pointing out that her actions created a near-certain fatal outcome. Witnesses were called to testify, including Alex Morales, whose persistence had reopened the case. He described Ryan's expertise and the unlikelihood of an accident involving such an experienced skydiver. Forensic experts provided technical explanations of the tampering, leaving no doubt that the malfunction had been deliberate. The jury listened intently as each piece of evidence solidified the prosecution's narrative. Natalie's defense team attempted to shift the focus to her emotional state at the time of the incident. They argued that her actions were driven by temporary insanity brought on by betrayal and emotional distress. They painted her as a woman overwhelmed by humiliation and heartbreak, who acted impulsively without fully understanding the consequences. Natalie's tearful testimony about her pain and her strained relationship with Ryan elicited some sympathy but it was not enough to sway the jury. After weeks of testimony, the jury deliberated for less than two days before returning a guilty verdict on the charge of first-degree murder. Natalie showed little reaction as the sentence was read, life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ryan's family, seated behind the prosecution table, wept quietly, finally feeling a sense of justice for their son and brother. In the aftermath of the trial, Ryan's family used the life insurance payout Natalie had originally received to establish the Ryan Bennett Skydiving Safety Foundation. The organization focused on educating skydivers about equipment maintenance, the warning signs of tampering, and mental health resources for those involved in extreme sports. Alex Morales became a key advocate for the foundation, using his platform to promote awareness about the importance of vigilance and integrity in the skydiving community. The story of Natalie and Ryan became a cautionary tale widely discussed in both legal and psychological circles. Experts dissected the case as an example of how unresolved emotional turmoil and unchecked resentment could spiral into devastating actions. Natalie's calculated sabotage, veiled behind the guise of reconciliation, served as a chilling reminder of how betrayal and anger could drive someone to commit the unthinkable. For Ryan's family and friends, the loss remained a painful scar. Yet through their advocacy, his legacy became one of safety and awareness. Meanwhile, Natalie's fate stood as a stark warning of the consequences of allowing bitterness to fester unchecked. Her story became a tragic symbol of a love turned toxic, leaving behind a legacy of heartbreak and caution.